So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this session of Justice in Action. My name is Tess Summer, and I'm the program, program manager for the Center for Social Responsibility at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Justice in Action is a conversation series about the various ways that COVID-19 has impacted and exacerbated existing inequalities in New York City. It's hosted by the JCC Social Justice Activist in Residence, Ruth, Ruth Messenger, and New York City Council Member Brad Lander. Uh, Brad Lander, unfortunately, might not be able to join us tonight, but he might pop in about half an hour into the show. Um, today, we'll be talking about how the pandemic has impacted mental health and the utilization of mental health services. Joining us is Matt Kudish, the Executive Director of New York City's National Alliance on Mental Illness, and Fiona Lowenstein, the co-founder of Body Politic and founder of the Body Politic COVID-19 Support Group, which has connected thousands of COVID patients with the chance to feel connected and supported um, through a support group through a variety of ways. Uh, thank you to our co-sponsors, Romamu Central Synagogue, B'nai Jeshurun, Abodah, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the National Council of Jewish Women, New York, CBST, SAJ, and Repair the World, Brooklyn and Harlem. Uh, and one final note, uh, while we're committed to hosting this conversation series, the uh, views and opinions expressed by our panelists do not necessarily reflect the official policy of the co-hosts or of the JCC. And Reed, you can take it away. Okay, I'm gonna take it away in one minute, but um, I wanna first say um, that if Council Member Lander is able to join us, that will be great, but he, as an elected official, the demands on his time are horrendous and he has not missed a session of Justice in Action until tonight when he was double booked, so we'll forgive him. And I also wanna take this minute, so I don't forget at the end, to thank Tess Summer, who's been our producer extraordinaire. Um, Tess is moving on from the JCC to an organizer education job in uh, health and housing in the Bronx. And we expect to have her on the program as a guest before too long, but it's an opportunity to thank her for her work with the Center for Social Responsibility, but also her work with the Justice in Action program. Thank you. As, as Tess said, this series got started, whatever it is now, I don't know, someone, someone spare me, six or seven months ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, with the idea that all kinds of issues in New York we're gonna be impacted by the pandemic, by the threats to the people of the city from education to small businesses, to housing, to hunger for sure. And um, the sad news, we were very pleased to be doing this program. And I just say the sad news is we haven't run out of issues um, that we might wanna talk about. And tonight we've been asked, is one we've been actually trying to address for a while. And it's the connections between COVID, mental illness or emotional disturbance and mental health. And we have two guests and I, I'm, I'm sure they'll find lots to agree on, but they come at this issue from somewhat different perspectives. So I'm gonna um, uh, ask them each to take uh, a few minutes separately to tell you a little bit about themselves and their organization and what, what else they do in the world other than COVID and then how the role that COVID is playing in their work now. And so let me turn first to Matt Kudish and just ask you to give us the whole context, Matt. What, what was your work um, before? Um, what are the connections that you see? Um, and what, and what, uh, what has motivated you to connect up the work you're doing to the existence of the pandemic? Yeah, sure. So first, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity um, to participate. Uh, my name is Matt Kudish. I'm the executive director of NAMI New York City. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, we are a 38-year-old nonprofit organization that was uh, founded by a group of parents who were caring for their children with mental health challenges, who 40 years ago had nowhere to turn for help. And they said, if we're not going to get any help uh, out here, we're going to build it ourselves. And that was really the way in which this organization was founded and the way in which uh, we exist still today. We are very much a grassroots organization, which when we use that word means we, um, our, our classes and our groups are led by people with lived experience. They are not necessarily mental health professionals. They are uh, professionals and experts in the, what they have lived through. And we have a robust training program to teach them um, how to facilitate classes, how to run support groups, how to support people through our telephone helpline. 
And um, we would not be able to do what we do without our incredible, you know, we have over 300 active, dedicated volunteers. Uh, something else about us that I think is important to mention is when we say peers, we're not only talking about people who are living with mental health issues, we're also talking about their family members and their friends. We're the only, one of the only organizations in the city of New York that provides support to family and friends and caregivers of people with mental health issues, in addition to mental uh, Ill, individuals living with mental illness themselves. Matt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt for one minute because it turns yeah. occurs to me that many of our listeners may be, um, or viewers or whatever we call them, that much of our audience may be people who have lots of, of interest in or issues in their own families with mental health challenges. So could, before you get to the COVID moment, could you just give a couple of, of examples of what you were just talking about? What, what's a support group that you run? What's the kind of services that you provide? Yeah, so everything we do is in a parallel process of uh, individuals living with mental health issues and then family members and friends. So our helpline, which is the primary way that people first make contact with us, you can pick up the phone and call and you will be speaking with either people in recovery or family caregivers and, and, and other loved ones who've been trained to help you navigate this uh, very often complicated uh, road. And um, if you participate in our classes, we have classes for, we have a class called Peer to Peer that is led by and for people living with mental illness themselves. We have a class called Basics, which is for parents of young children, who parents are caregivers of young children who are dealing with these issues to teach them how to be a better advocate and order of their child and help inform and their understanding of what's going on with their child. We also have a class called Family to Family, uh, which is designed for and taught by family and friends of individuals living with mental illness. I think very often we think about the person living with mental illness, and of course that person needs and deserves uh, care and dignity and respect and support, but we believe that when you support everybody who is around that individual, the people who know them best, who care about them most, with the knowledge and the skill to um, come at this from a way that ends up um, helping relationships rather than hurting them, then the individual who's sort of in the middle of that circle is much more likely to, to be on a uh, quicker path uh, and sustain that path of recovery. We have over 30 support groups that take place every single month. We have both socialization groups as well as emotional support groups. And we offer both of those kinds of groups for people living with mental health issues and family members and friends. So lots of opportunities to come into a room, a Zoom room right now, and be with people who you don't have to explain why you're pulling your hair out today about this difficult situation. Everybody there gets it, the, the teachers, the other, um, participants in the program there's just a shared understanding because we've been there we get it you don't have to explain we understand what you're going through uh, so that's sort of the, the premise of our work we uh, focus on three uh, pillars education support and advocacy uh, and everything we do is 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 that peer-based model of pe individuals helping individuals families helping families uh, prior to the pandemic uh, we were responding to about 300 calls a month on our helpline, uh, the last, and in uh, year 19, we served 19,000 individuals. Uh, the last two weeks of March, we saw a 60% increase in the call volume to our helpline. And starting in June and July, that increase jumped to 200% over pre-pandemic numbers. So we're, we're averaging nearly 1,000 calls a month right now. Uh, so and that, that that increase has held steady in the months since the summer. And I think as the longer this goes on and as we enter winter uh, and holiday time, which tends to be harder for folks in general, um, kind of getting through this pandemic during these really difficult months, I think we'll likely see that, that uh, increase uh, maybe even grow. Uh, in fiscal year 20, which just ended June 30th, we, we um, served 29,000 individuals. And so that's a, a over 50% increase over the year before. And many of those individuals came in that last quarter of the year when we saw these really sharp increases in people reaching out for help. So that's, a, think, that's, a, that's a huge increase. And of course, I wanna come back to you in a minute to hear what, you, what the complaints are and what you're doing with all of that. I don't wanna leave uh, Fiona just watching our, our ping pong back and forth. <laughs> So, um, Fiona, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? And I think you came into all of this in a quite different way. You're not a 40-year-old organization. So, at least bring us up to speed as to how you got into this and what you're doing. Then we'll let Matt, then we'll let each of you talk about the current work you're doing. 
Yeah, for sure. So um, my my background is in journalism and health journalism specifically. I've long been interested in kind of the intersections between wellness, health, social justice, and culture. Um, and so prior to the pandemic, I ran Body Politic, which um, used to be a queer feminist wellness collective event series and media startup based here in New York City. And we actually had a few events at the JCC, which some of you may have seen. Um, we did an event on size, inclusivity, and fitness, um, and trauma and healing. Um, and uh, so, so that was kind of our focus prior to the pandemic. Um, but in in March uh, of this year, I I got sick with COVID, and I got sick uh, quite early on in the pandemic hitting the U.S. So, um, Body Politics creative director, who's a close friend of mine, came over to my house on March 10th for kind of one last in-person meeting. Nothing had fully shut down yet. You know, we were only just starting to hear about community spread. Um, and I actually watched her get sick in front of my eyes. She suddenly got very pale. She said, oh my God, I don't feel well. And you know, we we didn't want to assume the worst and COVID was still very new, but she went home right away. I cleaned my apartment a little bit. And then uh, three days later, I was showing symptoms as well. So um, I'm 26, I, I don't have any significant underlying uh, prior health conditions. And um, at that point in time, the media narrative was very much that if you are young, if you are otherwise healthy, you know, this should really just manifest as a mild cold. Um, that was not my experience. I ended up being hospitalized briefly on March 16th for shortness of breath. I was not put on a ventilator, but I received su supplemental oxygen and was monitored. Um, and then at the point where my symptoms seemed to be subsiding, again, my, my only real symptoms were kind of fever and, and shortness of breath at that point. Um, they discharged me and, and sent me home and I expected to, you know, recover somewhat quickly, again, being being young and otherwise healthy. <clears throat> but that was not my experience. So I, I started to develop a whole other host of symptoms um, over the course of March, April, May, and, and even a little bit into June. So I was sick for close to three months. Um, I am what we now refer to as a COVID long hauler or a long COVID survivor. Um, I'm one of the lucky few that that has mostly recovered. Um, but my symptoms included, you know, GI issues, dermatological issues, headaches, uh, migraines, sinus pain, um, uh, circulation issues, all sorts of things that really were not being discussed in the mainstream media at the time. So my first, you know, instinct, honestly, the, the day that I was discharged from the hospital was to write about what had what I had been through because I, it, I sensed that there was not enough of a widespread understanding that young people or people my age could could actually get quite sick with this. Um, so I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of days after I came home from the hospital, just about my experience of of being young and, and getting so seriously sick. Um, and I started to hear from COVID patients all over the world. Um, they were emailing me and DMing me on Instagram. Um, and they had, you know, some, some very tangible basic questions like, how did you know whether or not to go to the hospital? What did they do for you there? When did they know to discharge you? But they also just really wanted emotional support. I mean, I can tell you firsthand that getting diagnosed with COVID, especially early on in the pandemic, was incredibly anxiety producing because this is an illness and symptoms that you've seen sensationalized on the news for months at this point. So having that community of these people that I was talking to, and at this point, again, I was just talking to them individually, was really helpful in those first couple of weeks. And then as I started to develop these other symptoms that were not at that point listed on the CDC symptom list that were not being talked about on CNN, um, I started to, you know, talk with some of these people about those symptoms as well. Um, I remember actually losing my sense of smell, and it was maybe an hour after I had realized I couldn't smell that that uh, the person who infected me, who who I was still in close touch with, texted me saying, you know, did you lose your sense of smell? Because I can't smell. And this was something again we were not hearing talked about widely. So it was clear very early on that there was. Um, at least clear to me that there was a that patients were not recovering quickly that not all patients were recovering within kind of the two weeks that the world health organization had estimated and a lot of the patients i was talking to were similarly young did not understand what was happening to them and and a majority of them also had not been able to access the care that i had accessed so many of them had not uh even been able to access a covid test many of them had been turned away from hospitals and i think you know even if i had gone to the hospital maybe a week later that my situation could have been different um, so, so we recognize the need for kind of this peer-to-peer -peer support network. Um, we already had this platform through Body Politics, so we launched the COVID-19 support group at the end of March. Um, and at that point, it was small, maybe 30 people or so on Instagram, just talking to each other, kind of sharing advice, you know, things they'd heard from their doctors, but also, again, just being there for each other, being there when you wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, you're gasping for breath, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just feeling afraid. Um, 
being there for each other, you know, while, while being physically isolated often, right? I was, I was quarantined to my room for, you know, a little over two weeks. Um, and then as I started to notice this and notice that I wasn't the only one who wasn't getting better, I, I realized I wanted to write about it again. So I wrote a second op-ed in the New York Times, you know, uh, less than a month later in early April, which is, I think, one of the first reported pieces on the phenomenon of long COVID, where I basically talked about my own experience and what I saw these other patients experiencing. And the fact that we had started this little chat group for patients who wanted to talk to one another. Well, within 24 hours of that article being published, we had over 2,000 people sign up to join the support group. So what, what seemed like a good idea and seemed like you know something people might need was it became very clear that there was a huge, huge demand for this. And almost everyone who was joining was saying, I thought I was completely alone. I had no idea there was anyone out there experiencing the things that I was experiencing. So the group has, has really grown from there. Um, and uh, we now have uh, about 9,000 active members. Um, we've had over 18,000 people sign up to join our larger uh, network, which includes um, our allied support network, which is comprised of doctors and you know, medical professionals, healthcare providers, um, folks in wellness who, who are interested in doing seminars and ask me anything sessions with these patients. Um, and, and now the group, in addition to providing emotional support, has honestly become a bit of a headquarters for the COVID patient advocacy movement. And I will say, on a personal level, just speaking about mental health, the thing that really got me through those months of being sick was having this outlet for advocacy um, and, and, and being able to help other people help me get outside of myself it helped me contextualize my own situation. It also made me feel like I was doing something at a time where I think many of us in New York felt incredibly helpless in March and April when we were seeing the situation, but where we're many of us were locked inside our homes. Okay, so fantastic. So we're also gonna come back to you, but Matt, I'm sort of still, now Fiona has, has doubled the, the experience that you've reported of these millions of people coming out of the woodwork, being going online. But Matt, when you say that you've had vast increase in numbers, I'm really concerned. I'm really interested in what people are calling you about and, and what services you're providing because, um, as Fiona just indicated, and Fiona, I think I'm right in this, a lot of the people contacting Fiona were the people with this universal group of symptoms. I mean, they had all these problems that, that people assumed would be over, but they weren't over. But, but those range from the physical health to the um, uh, sense of smell to whatever. And Matt, you're saying that NAMI, which is known to be a provider for mental health services, had this huge increase. So what were people asking you? What were they, what were they calling to say? Yeah, so the increase actually was really interesting to me. We, had, we got calls from groups of people who were long-standing, deeply connected members of NAMI New York City. They come to our groups regularly, they come to, they participate, they volunteer with us and they were concerned about their own recovery, their own to sustain their recovery. When the, uh, more about, I think, the um, isolation that was required as an outcome of COVID, concerns about physical health, getting the virus, concerns about getting their medication, seeing their doctors, maintaining their treatment plans, um, food, they were about getting food, and if they order food in, the, the, you know, remember early on, we were wearing gloves and washing everything, and we didn't really understand the, the surface piece of it. So there was a tremendous amount of anxiety uh, around what is going to happen next and what about me and my care. And then we saw um, a group of people who had been connected to us, but who had not been in touch for a while. You know, and we, we have a very wide open front door. You come and you go as you please. Um, at your leisure, we're here for life. Uh, and so people who had either not, not had symptoms and that they needed to have support around or they had sort of moved on and didn't feel the need to stay as connected to us, they came back. And they were wondering, well, what if I need to start treatment again as an outcome of this? I don't even have a provider. How am I going to get a provider? And how am I going to see that provider given everything going on? And those same sort of issues to this group of people who had been uh, maintaining their stability and their, their recovery independent from us. Uh, and now with the, the pandemic looming, uh, there were real concerns and they reconnected. And then we got uh, calls from a whole group of people who self-reported never having concerns about their own mental health before. And all of a sudden, I'm not sleeping so well, um, I'm distracted and not able to focus, uh, I'm feeling sad, I'm sort of like my mood is depressed in this way. What's going on? I don't, what is this? Is this normal? Am I okay? So I think we saw a real swath 
a, a varied um, individuals reaching out for us of these these different groups. And what we do is we provide information, education, and support on our helpline. So in some cases, you call them, we can just normalize what you're going through. This is a, a common response to the, the trauma that we're all living through and experiencing. We can tell you about our internal programs, the support groups in the classrooms that I mentioned before. Uh, and we did start in April a wellness chat, uh, which uh, is really just a weekly uh, support group for people who wanted to come and just talk about the way in which the ways in which they were coping with the current situation. Just not about a diagnosis. It was more just about, and I don't, I don't, even necessarily mean a COVID diagnosis, but even a mental health diagnosis. It was just a place to come and sort of process the feelings about living in this, in this during these really difficult, challenging times. Uh, and that group continues uh, to this day on a weekly, on a weekly basis. Um, and I think we also referred people to external resources. So our helpline, we have a very robust resource directory with over 500 um, different uh, groups or, or uh, different resources for whatever you may need, whether it's legal assistance or housing or employment, uh, medicine, therapy. Uh, we have a, a vetted list of resources that we can provide. So we needed to make sure that we had up-to-date COVID-19 information about all of these places, what services are available in person, what are what's not, so that we weren't sending people out uh, just to find out that there wasn't anybody there because they had closed. Um, and then over the summer, we launched um, a group called, in June, called Black Minds Matter, recognizing that uh, the pandemic was um, affecting, disproportionately affecting Black and Brown communities, uh, communities of color and underserved communities in general. After the death of George Floyd, we started to see an increase in calls uh, from individuals who are identifying as Black and having mental health challenges and really looking for a place to be with community. Uh, with people who look like them, who who had shared experience of living as a Black individual in this country and dealing with a mental health issue on top of that. And so we started Black Minds Matter, uh, and that group has really taken off. It started as a monthly group and then a twice a month group, and now it's every week. Uh, and the, the feedback that we're hearing from, from the participants in this group, I've been looking for something like this forever and I've never been able to find it. It's so nice to be with people who understand what this experience is. And I think, you know, we're seeing, I think it's, it, it feels safe to say that I think we're seeing an increase in empathy across the board. I think that group of people who were calling who had never dealt with these issues before, um, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I think these are the are some of the folks who might use some kind of language of, well, what's the matter with you? You're not trying hard enough. Just get out of bed because they don't really understand the ways in which depression, by example, can actually physically impact you. Um, and it's not as easy as just try harder. And I think for some to be experiencing just some level of changes in their mood, of changes in, in their their anxiety, their ability to cope and handle what's coming at them. It, it's sort of a dip your toe in the shallow end of the pool just to get a sense. It gives you a little sense of, oh yeah, I can't control the way that I'm feeling right now. This is a little bit more of what, of what it might be like for people who struggle with these issues all the time. And interestingly, and then I'll be quiet, um, what we heard from people who uh, were living with mental illness and um, they said, oh, now everyone's dealing with uh, social isolation. Now that you know how we feel every day of the year. Uh, and so I think that there's, there's learning happening here. And my hope is, I'm trying to be silver linings. Uh, my hope is that we can, we can continue to make progress on, on the empathy piece and the understanding piece and really leverage this, this moment to reduce stigma and reduce discrimination and normalize talking about mental health. If you're not doing okay, that's okay. You need to just talk about it. We need to create that space to reduce stigma. Um, so I promise I'd be quiet. No, that's fantastic. And I actually have some follow-up questions, but Fiona, I want to go back to you now because you sort of told us your story, which is pretty dramatic and a little scary. It sounds like you were the pioneer in getting sick and the pioneer in continuing to have symptoms. And I understand that you formed, you took body politic and formed it into this COVID support group and had immediately huge numbers of people contacting you and joining. But if you can, could you focus in on the mental health aspects of either what you're hearing from people um, who contact you or, or um, the services that you are finding yourself needing to provide or both? 
Yeah, definitely. So first off, I will say that some of you may have seen a recent article in Reuters talking about a study that shows very high rates of mental health issues amongst COVID patients. Um, and this is following several other research studies that both show, again, mental health issues just with, without a, a, an attempt to look at what the cause of these issues are, but also studies that are indicating that COVID can impact the neurological system and in some cases cause mental illnesses such as anxiety, depression, psychosis, et cetera. So COVID patients are dealing with mental health issues on a very high level. And some of that is environmental, right? Again, having a disease that you're seeing talked about in the news that you're that you know that other people are afraid of I mean that produces anxiety of course depression and and, and social isolation also comes along with that physical isolation um, I wrote about this for Teen Vogue last this past summer but a lot of COVID patients uh, myself included reported sort of losing touch with the initial support systems that they used to rely on prior to getting sick because the experience of being sick for so long can be very socially isolating. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that as a society, we don't really talk about how to engage with people who are sick but are not getting better. So a lot of the ways that you know support manifests when you are ill is, is friends saying, are you feeling better yet? You know, do you think you're gonna feel better next week? Like this is crazy, it's taking so long, that sort of thing, right? Language that ultimately you know, comes from a place of love, but, but is entrenched often in, in kind of ableist assumptions of, of the way that you know, the human body works and the way that the world works. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure on a patient, right? You wanna be able to say, yes, I'm getting better. And, and I've talked to patients who have told me, oh, I lie to my family and friends and tell them I'm doing better than I am because it's just too hard to answer the endless barrage of questions. And that brings me to the second reason that I think a lot of COVID patients experience social isolation, which is that a lot of COVID patients, especially long COVID patients, are not believed. Um, and this is common, this is not new, this is common, you know, kind of across chronic illness communities when a disease is invisible, um, and especially for COVID patients who uh, got sick early on in the pandemic in New York City. Again, I mentioned I was one of the few people really in New York City who was able to get access to a test in March and April, and that was because I was hospitalized. So many patients were told, don't leave your house, don't seek medical care, do not go and get tested, there are not enough tests. And unfortunately, uh, now that we're six or seven months down the line, those patients who don't have those positive test results from their early symptom onset are often unable to get additional paid time off from employers. They're often uh, disbelieved by family and friends. And they often also face issues just getting comprehensive health care from clinicians because clinicians are still undereducated on this issue. And that, you know, having, not having that positive COVID test is sometimes seen as sort of a, a lack of proof. Um, so this was part of the reason that I think the group took off so quickly was that the first need that was clear was that these patients needed validation. And, and in many ways that could only be provided from other patients, right? Hearing, I think it's similar to, to you know, what, what we were hearing uh, Matt say about kind of how NAMI was founded, um, the idea that, you know, people who have the lived experience are the ones who can truly understand you and who you can trust. Um, so that was really important. But there were also other issues that patients were dealing with. They were, you know, again, mentioning this medical gaslighting and, and having trouble finding clinicians. And that was taking a real toll on their mental health. Um, so we set up uh, webinars and Ask Me Anything sessions with clinicians who we had vetted, who we knew understood long COVID, so that even those patients who aren't able to find a long-term clinician through these sessions at least get that you know, hour of typing questions and getting them answered by someone who really understands. We also have a user-generated healthcare providers list, which spans, uh, you know, most continents in the world and people add healthcare providers that they meet, you know, based on, and they'll add notes. They'll add notes about whether or not these people understand long COVID. They'll also add notes about the clinician's identity, you know, notes like this, this is a black woman and she totally understands the experience of being gaslit, trying to navigate healthcare systems. And I'll also say that these issues of, you know, not being able to find a clinician who understands you or, or having, having issues navigating the healthcare system, they were coming up most often for women, for BIPOC, for LGBTQ plus folks and more. So we have, um, our, our group is housed on Slack now um, uh, and we have various different channels for different topics of conversation. So we have a private BIPOC channel, we have a private LGBTQ plus channel, and we also have a medical advocacy channel. And these are places, safe spaces, where people can really come together with their communities and talk about the issues that are specific to them. And the medical advocacy channel is a place where people exchange tips like, if your doctor says they won't test you for something or they won't run a certain test, have them write that down in your chart, right? I mean, that's, that's a very tangible piece of advice. Um, but we've also had to think a lot about what does it mean to provide emotional support? And so we, we have an onboarding guide that every patient receives when they join the group. 
And our group is also private. It is, this was a conscious decision we made to limit it to patients only. You have to sign up through a Google form and give just a brief explanation of why you want to join the group. This differentiates our group from, from a lot of the other, I think most of the other COVID support groups that are out there, um, you know, which have reporters in them and people who are interested in COVID. Again, we really wanted to make this a safe space that, that, is, that is only for patients. Um, so I think that, you know, as time went on, it became clear to us that emotional support is, is and we list this in the onboarding guide, it, it's not coming up with solutions for someone's problem. It, it's oftentimes saying, I, I recognize what you're saying or resonates with me or I'm listening to you, right? And, and that's been a learning curve on our part as well. The group is also entirely run by, by administrators who were once COVID patients themselves and members in the support group. Um, and we have a variety of other initiatives, including a patient-led research team. So we really believe that centering the patient is, is the best way to kind of provide that validation and provide that emotional support, you know, without going directly to, to sort of providing unsolicited advice, even though, you know, people will occasionally ask for specific advice and, and there will be exchanges like that. Fantastic. All right, Matt, I'm going to go back to you. And I think each of you mentioned this, but I want to pursue it for a minute because it's of interest to me. So I understand people people's rising levels of anxiety, whether they have it or they don't. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But one thing that you mentioned very briefly that, that I've actually heard from some people I know, and that is the sudden experience of social isolation. So, I mean, just as an example, without identification, you know, I was on a Zoom call about a bunch of stuff about a month ago. And somebody I know who runs an organization, and she's a highly competent person. And, you know, we were talking about all the challenges to executive directors, right? Like, do you open your office? Do you close your office? How sympathetic should you be to staff members who have children crawling all over their laps while they're to be homeschooled? Well, you know, we were talking about all of that. And then she suddenly said, I didn't even ask her. She said, well, you know, but for me, I do that all day. And I have to make all those decisions for my organization. And then I go home and I'm not married and I don't have a partner right now. And instead of doing all the things I did to let off steam, to enjoy the city that I'm in, and basically to try to create a social life for myself and find a partner, I'm at home alone the other 16 hours of the day. And so I just would like each of you to comment on that because I want to say that until she said that to me, that had not occurred to me as a major problem in changing people's lives. Yeah, I think we are social beings. We're not meant to be to be alone like this. Um, and whether you're you're living alone or you're living with a roommate that you don't even really know all that well, or you're living with your family who you know really well and don't want to be with all the time, uh, I don't know that there's a winning sort of outcome to this. Uh, and I think you know, to me, that really speaks to the importance of looking at this issue and these last eight months and however long it continues through the lens of trauma. Like this is, a, this is a collective trauma that we're living through and there's no right or wrong way to respond to that trauma. Some people might find motivation in it. Uh, other people might find that they're, they're completely uh, stuck and, and anything in between is possible. Uh, and I think, I think giving people permission to feel the way they're feeling and not judge those feelings. I think we're the first generation that has feelings about our feelings. So I'm feeling isolated, I'm feeling alone, I'm feeling sad and then I feel like, well, I don't, I'm healthy, I have the food I need, I have toilet paper, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's so many people who are dealing with so much more than me. It, we, it's not helpful to compare what's going on with me and what's going on with you. Um, I need to stop at the, the feelings that I'm feeling before I start to poo-poo them away. Because if I undermine my own ability to actually grieve the losses, whether it's a loss of life, loss of community, loss of going to work, loss of graduation or a wedding, um, loss of a soccer game. I mean, there's a, it's not, it's not about comparing my loss to your loss. It's about recognizing we're all dealing with grief. We're all dealing with loss. Just, just the loss of the life the way we knew it, the world the way we knew it is enormous and it's going to have an impact on on our mental health, for sure, without a doubt. How it affects us and what we do with that is really, I think, about self-care and resilience. So we wanna be making sure that we're paying attention to what our needs are. And I think so often self-care these days becomes prescribed. So it's, oh, do yoga, meditate, or go for a run. Well, if I don't do any of those things, what is self-care really to me? And I wanna give people permission to say self-care is what I need in this moment to feel okay. 
It might be meditation, yoga, or a run, and it might be just crying for a little while. Maybe I just need a good cry. It might be taking a half hour break and reading a chapter of a book or watching a TV show that I love. It could mean myriad things. Um, and it's about meeting that need when I need it. And then focusing on resiliency so that even if you're alone, and again, the, I mentioned the comment before about um, some of our, our participants saying, oh, you know, I've, I've been dealing with these, this isolation my whole life. And they say, people are talking about Zoom happy hours. Well, I don't have 15 friends to get together with on Friday. You don't need 15 friends. You need one person, two people, maybe. You just need some way to connect with people, whether it's the phone, outside social distancing, via video chat like this, that connectivity is critical so that even if you are physically isolated, you are socially connected. You just need one lifeline. And maybe it's our helpline, right? Maybe it's, it's uh, Fiona's group. You just, right. need, you just need to stay connected. That's so important. And not be afraid to find someone you trust. And again, it can be an anonymous call to a helpline, but somewhere to put those feelings so that you're not sort of ruminating and stewing in it and trying to figure it out yourself while going through it. That's we can't do it alone. I That's think. very, so I very give helpful. Someone, someone just posted in the chat that, that for some people it feels like being on house arrest. Um, sure. No, so I think that's good. Um, uh, 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 by the way, people, if you have questions and you post them, I will pick them up or Tess will get them to me. So Fiona, it sounded to me like more of the people that you're hearing from are actually people who have COVID um, and then have all these con things connected to it. But are you also aware of people that are like the ones that I was talking about that Matt was picking up on who are just, just like terminally anxious or isolated and can't function because of that? Absolutely, and there's also absolutely overlap, right, between these these two groups. I mean, the, the feeling of being terminally anxious, I think, is one that a lot of us have right now, regardless of whether our lives have been personally impacted by COVID in terms of, you know, you, you or your family getting the, the illness itself. Um, and, and I also think that, you know, it's it's important. I think March and April were incredibly devastating in New York, and, and it was a, a time of grief, and it was a very difficult time for all of us, but there also, in the same way that there was collective trauma, there was, I think, a real feeling of community and, and banding together, even from within our homes. I'm certainly not the first person to say this, but it, it's it's social distancing is sort of the wrong word, right? It's, it's physical distancing. And I think in March and April, people really got creative about figuring out ways to come together socially online. Um, you know, obviously my support group was was one of the things that that was created in that time. Matt has mentioned a, a couple of uh, the resources that that NAMI has created. So I think that at this summer when cases dropped, uh, a lot of people, you know, returned to some semblance of normal life. People, more people were leaving the house. And, and an unfortunate side effect of that, while I think it was great that cases dropped and people were able to get outside a little bit more, is that I do think more of a gulf emerged between those patients who, uh, you know, those people who did not feel safe going outside, whether it was, you know, mental health reasons. I mean, there are patients in my support group who developed agoraphobia because they were inside for so long that they began to think of outside as bad and inside as good. As e and even once they recovered, going outside was difficult. Or whether, you know, you're elderly or autoimmune compromised or have some other reason that, you know, you're particularly worried about the virus versus perhaps those that feel more invulnerable. I think again that this gulf emerged a bit more in the summer where we where we we were perhaps less cohesive as a community we were doing we were making different choices we were doing different things and and as we head toward you know potentially a second lockdown and and the rise of cases that indicates a second wave I really hope that we're able to kind of come together in that in that community way again and think creatively about virtual solutions to to creating social connection um, I also think you know Matt really hit hit the nail on the head in terms of self care and the way that we talk about that and and this is something that that came up early within our patient group, but is definitely relevant to everyone is a lot of, in addition to self-care often feeling somewhat prescriptive, you know, in the way that we talk about it, and something we've always talked about at Body Politic is what does it mean to have non-prescriptive wellness options, right? Just to, to, to offer a variety of options and not with a value judgment on whether or not you choose one over the other. Um, again, for, for people who have different needs, for people who are differently abled, the, some of these self-care options are just not available. So for myself in March and April, I was not attending any Zoom happy hours because I, I had trouble speaking because my shortness of breath, right? I wasn't going on walks outside of the house because I thought I might be still infectious. Um, and so I think, again, thinking outside of the box and, and imagining that self-care 
you know, we should, we, let's not just think about, you know, the healthy 26 year old and, and what might be best for them in terms of cocktails and Zoom happy hours and yoga classes. What can we think about, you know, that's outside of the box, that's creative, that's going to bring us together, you know, with, with other people who are perhaps unlike ourselves and how can we bridge the gaps generally, generationally within our own families, within our own communities, and also bridge those gaps so that people who are not, you know, uh, who, who don't feel invulnerable to the virus uh, don't feel alone. Because I think the worst, the only thing worse than having to lock down is having to lock down and feeling like you're the only one doing it. So that's that's what I'm hoping for as we move into I have, the fall. I have another question for the two of you, but first, um, Fiona, someone posted like, what's the future of, the, of body politic as an organization? So you wanna check that out? Yeah, so um, we we are increasingly doing advocacy work. Um, we've been meeting with the World Health Organization and the CDC and the NIH, um, and our patient-led research team uh, is is very involved in this work as well. So we're really trying to provide a patient's perspective to pandemic policies, to research design around long COVID. Um, but first and foremost, the purpose of the group is emotional support, and I think that is why it has become so popular. That is where the initial attention from the press and and you know the public came from, and so that is that is the first priority certainly but but as we move forward of course i'll be continuing to try and raise awareness via you know media and, and the press as being a journalist that's that's the route that i always take and then you know others are doing letter writing campaigns and, and once again this we often differentiate between emotional support and advocacy as two different goals i do see advocacy as a version of as a method of emotional support and a method oftentimes of, of kind of healing and so i think when people come to the group it's kind of a choose your own adventure right you have a bunch of different paths you can take you can tell your story in the media you can join the patient research team you can write letters you can come to a meeting with the world health organization and and so you kind of choose what what you know speaks to you and what excites you the most and it's nice to see these patients light up like that Good. Matt, you look at it. Yeah, to Fiona's point about advocacy being emotional support, I was actually talking to my therapist yesterday, um, not just casually, but in session, and we were talking about um, what was lost during all of this. And, and what we got to was possibility. Possibility. The possibilities sort of were taken away. We had no idea what the future was going to hold. For so long, every day we we're getting more and more new information that contradicted previous information. When the possibilities are gone, it's incredibly scary because you have no idea what's coming. Advocacy, getting involved to do something about it, creates possibilities. And so it's, it's, tr it's really empowering when you say, I'm going, and you have a community in which to do it, I'm going to take this situation and I'm going to, I'm going to make some noise about it. I'm going to rattle the cages a little bit and I'm going to, I'm going to do some, put this energy that I have into something else. And I, I think to me that you're growing possibilities when you focus on it that way. That's I totally idea. agree. I want to ask one other question of both of you and you, you both touched on this a little bit and Fiona, you touched on it, I guess, specifically because you, as you say, you, you keep writing about it. But when I listen to some of your description, and Matt, this is when you were answering the last question, if large numbers of people are, have lost some sense of possibility and are anxious about what's gonna come next, that affects at some level, measurable or not measurable, every workplace, every classroom, um, every family, and I just wonder um, what what do you see as the each of you the need and the options, and what are you able to do to bring it to that much larger level of attention? In other words, you're helping the individuals, and I mean, I'll just give you as one example. I again, I gave a speech which was about the election to a, a, a junior high school and a high school, um, and the head of school who brought me in to do the speech about the election told me that this is a school, it's a private school, so they're totally back in session, but the teachers are saying that they can't teach the same amount that they taught before, because the students are just not there. And that was staggering to me, and I'm just wondering, like, who is telling all the schools, who is telling those of us like me, who used to be, you know, a CEO of an organization, that, you know, that yes, self-care, that's what you, you both spoke eloquently about self-care and self-care options and advocacy as a form of self-care. But is anybody saying, hey, you know, you ought to think about it's going to be harder to teach a certain body of knowledge. It's going to be harder to get a report out. It's going to be harder to whatever, because so many people are suffering with, or not suffering is not the fair word, but are challenged by the mental health aspects of this. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I sort of think it goes back to the collective trauma piece of it, that we are all living through this uh, and it's going to affect us in different ways. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that it's hard to deal and address, meaningfully address trauma when you're in the midst of it. And so in, the longer this goes on and the longer the opportunities for all of our worlds to continue to be turned upside down, and we don't yet know what the long-term effect will be because we're still sitting in the middle of it. And I think, we, I think you know, NAMI NYC, we're sitting right in the middle of everything going on. It, all of our mental health has been tested. All of our mental wellness is being, is being tested right now. Uh, and I think the, the biggest thing we have to do is continue to talk about it. And I think Fiona really brought this to light in an earlier comment. When you come out and say, I am going through this, and you are willing to take that step, people come out of the woodwork. You can't look at the response that, that she got so quickly for the group right at the beginning. I think people just want to understand, want to see that they're not alone, that they're not the only ones going through it. But I think we are, youth, the pandemic is still raging and the mental health pandemic is, is quickly catching up. Um, I, think, I think that's the only thing that we can do is to continue to talk about it, to continue to provide support for people, resources, um, uh, an understanding, non-judgmental, empathetic response, uh, and just help people get through it in, the, in any way that they can. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's fascinating to me. And I, let me just say, I'm going to say personally for a minute, I find the one most dramatic aspect of this for me, which Matt really spoke to, is that I have no idea when it will end. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I was at my sickest, the only thing that worked for me was telling myself one day at a time, one day at a time. And, and I do think that that's a mantra that is, is relevant to, to those who are not, you know, experiencing COVID symptoms as well. I, you know, Matt touched on this earlier, but it seems like if we were to look for a silver lining to this, to this whole experience, it would be the fact that many of the issues that our society has previously swept under the rug, mental illness, chronic illness, disability, ageism, many of these issues, we're having to peek under the rug right now. We're having to look at all of this stuff, examine ourselves, see the ways in which maybe we're more similar than we thought, the ways in which maybe we have associated shame with, with certain issues and, and, and made things worse because of it. Um, and I'm talking about both physical and mental illness here. Um, and so I think, you know, as, as, we, as we go forward, it, it's my hope that, I mean, I'm advocating for long COVID patients, but as I do so, I recognize that I'm advocating for patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and patients with endometriosis, and patients with chronic Lyme, and patients with POTS and dysautonomia and all of these other chronic illnesses that have also, where patients have also been gaslit, where patients have also dealt with social isolation. And so it feels like, I mean, for me, at least the hope is that the pandemic has kind of blown the lid off of all of these issues where you no longer have to stay silent about them. And perhaps, hopefully, you know, and, and certainly this is my hope with a new administration in the White House, and I'm, and I'm, I'm tentatively excited about the COVID task force, um, that, that hopefully there will be an actual approach to these issues that is not just a band-aid on a gunshot wound, but a systemic approach that is actually going to allow us to look at these if, issues differently long term. Well, that, that's if very I, Can helpful. I add one more thing? Go ahead. I think I'm with Fiona on the one day at a time. I've been saying I have no idea how I'm going to feel each day until my feet hit the floor in the morning. And I am open to whatever that will that will bring. I'm in this room ten hours a day, every week. Uh, and if uh, some days I can really feel like I'm cranking things out and getting things done, and other days I'm just sitting here like I just I can't do it. So I think going at it like that one day at a time is really key. And at the same time, I think we have to start thinking about not not necessarily. Um, uh, I think one day at a time, and preparing for what these next six months are gonna be like, especially as we as it's dark at 4.30 and the weather gets colder and the holidays are coming. I mean, seasonal affect disorder is real in the best of times. Uh, the holidays are hard for folks in the best of times. These are not the best of times. And so even though we're taking it one day at a time and trying to control the things we can control and try to let the rest of it go, it would be, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't emphasize how important it will be for people's well-being, COVID related and mental health related, to start thinking about what do I need to do to get through this winter? What do I need to do to get through this next, this next uh, chunk of time right now? And start to prepare and plan we're going to run out of time soon. Um, uh, we had a question in the chat box. I know this is without much information, but Fiona, why don't you take a crack on it first? One, somebody wrote who said she is a long hauler and she has three young children. 
um, and what's the best strategy? Do you explain to them that essentially your parent is sick and this is going to go on for a while, you, or do you try to shield them from it? And how do you deal with it? That's the essence of the question. Yeah, that I, I'm. First off, I'm very sorry to hear what you're going through, and and I know that just having long COVID feels like a full time job a lot of the time. So I I can't imagine you know parenting on top of that, and we have a lot of parents in our group who are who are dealing with you know a similar question. Um, you know, unfortunately, again, what I, I do think that the one kind of silver lining here is that your kids are getting the chance to learn about, you know, what, what chronic illness looks like and, and the different definitions of health. Um, and I think many of us grew up, you know, I was talking to a patient recently who said prior to getting sick, I, I didn't understand the term temporarily abled. I just thought there are healthy people and there are sick people and I'm a healthy person. Well, the reality is that all of us are temporarily abled, right? And, and I think shifting that perspective to, to sort of better understand that, that there, are, there are gradations of health, there are gradations of ability, um, and that, that having a chronic illness or a disability does not mean that life is not worth living. It does not mean that you know, you're any less than anyone else. I mean, that's the one kind of positive upside of this. Um, that being said, I think, you know, the COVID itself and, and the lack of information about long COVID is, is similar to all of the uncertainties with the pandemic. We don't know when we're going to get an answer on when treatment for long COVID will be available or even when comprehensive research will happen. All we can do is kind of keep fighting for what we, what we believe we need and, and hope that that will happen eventually. And this may be a decade long fight. Um, and maybe that's something that, that you can bring your children into as well, because we talked about advocacy as, as emotional support, right? Are there, are there ways that you can share with them, you know, what's going on with the emerging COVID patient advocacy movement and perhaps how, how you're getting involved or how others are getting involved and, and what that's felt like to you? Um, that, that would be my advice, but I'm, I'm by no means a therapist. And, and so I guess my last piece of advice is it's always great to talk to a therapist about this stuff. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's been my telehealth appointments with my therapist have definitely gotten me through this pandemic. Um, and so I think, you know, mental health resources in general are, are important to, to reach out to if you find yourself in this situation. You're both getting some nice compliments in the, in the um, chat. Um, um, Matt, why don't you pick up on, on, on your same th that thought there, but since we're getting close to the time for each of you, I mean, Fiona just did some of it, but what is it you would like people to do to be aware of how or when should people be in touch with you? What else can you recommend? Honestly, if you are concerned about yourself or someone else's mental health and you don't know what to do, pick up the phone and call We Are Here. I think you don't have to know the questions to ask. You don't have to understand any of it. We, are, we have trained staff and volunteers on the phones and on the email uh, for, for you to reach out to. You can do so anonymously or you can share your name with us. Uh, we just we want to have as wide a front door with as few barriers as possible. All of our programs and services are available free of charge to anyone who needs them. Uh, there's no no we don't we don't require any kind of information for you to get the support you need. Our support groups actually all they don't even need to call to find out. You can check out NamiNYC.org. Uh, there's a calendar with all of them on there. The Zoom links for all of them are there. What we have found most recently as well is not everyone has technology. Not everyone has Wi-Fi. Uh, how are we supporting people who don't have those resources? You can call into our groups as well, the way that some folks are, have called into here. And I think um, quite interestingly, it's a lot to show up at our office before all of this, to show up at our office and walk through the door of an organization with mental illness right on the door, right? It could take a lot of personal courage to, to build up before you're willing to take that step. This is actually a four silver lining. This is afforded, afforded folks an opportunity to come to a group, you call in, you put whatever name you want on there or your number, and you can just, just dip your toe in the water and get a sense of what it feels like. And if you don't wanna come back, you don't have to come back. And if you feel like sharing, you can share. I think the key is if you are struggling, find a way to reach out and get support. And if you see someone struggling, it's critical that you intervene and you ask them if they're okay and you try to be a bridge to connect them to resources that may help, whether it's NAMI NYC or a therapist or uh, a support, a emotional support group like Fiona's, uh, whatever, whatever the needs are, I just think it's so critical that we talk about them. Okay, uh, Fiona, your, your comments. Um, and we will, by the way, post the contact information and uh, for all of you whose emails we have, because you called into this, we will let you know how to get in touch with both NAMI and Body Politic.
So for, for obviously for COVID patients out there and you do not have to have tested positive for the virus and you do not have to be a long COVID patient, for any COVID patients out there and any caregivers of COVID patients, the Body Politic COVID-19 support group is available to you if you go to wearebodypolitic.com and, and I know we'll be sharing resources as well. But I also want to mention that right now the burden of, ad, of advocacy work is really falling on long COVID patients. Um, you know, I've mostly recovered and I'm still involved in the movement, but that's somewhat rare. So Tomorrow, Body Politic is actually launching a social media campaign around COVID patient allyship. What does it look like for all of us to kind of take on this mantle and first off, self-educate on, on what long COVID is, on what some of the patient issues, not just physical, but mental, emotional, financial are, um, and how can we start to talk about these issues in our communities? How can we start to talk, you know, if you're an employer, how can you rethink, you know, your paid leave policy or how you're going to uh, deal with patients who, you know, haven't tested positive, but but think they have COVID. Um, similarly for clinicians, you know, we're urging education on this issue, but COVID patient allyship is something that we can all engage in. And I think it's something that we all will have to engage in and keep our eye on even after the pandemic ends because many of these patients are likely to experience issues after that. So so that would be my urge. And you can also, of course, donate to, to Body Politics Support Group, which is entirely volunteer run by a, a, a group of patients and survivors, um, and I can share that link as well. Fantastic. So guys, we're, we're at time. Um, Tess uh, will send everybody who's called in the information about how to get in touch with each of these groups. I just want to say to Fiona and to Matt, I can only, since I don't have my co-host here with me, I can only keep track of some of the chat, but I don't think we've done a session in which we got nearly so many thank yous from people about just this is so informative i didn't know this i'm going to follow up i really appreciate it thank the people for giving of their time so that's lovely and i i have certainly learned a lot tonight but i'm also in awe of the of the responsibilities that each of you has taken to not only meet people's needs but to do um, advocacy with people and also to think about broader advocacy in the society can i say one thing real fast yes we have our annual gala on Monday night, the Seeds of Hope Gala. Uh, and this is not a prop here for that. I just saw it and remembered, and I would <laughs> kick myself later if I didn't say it. Kelly Rippa is hosting. It's free and open to the public. NamiNYCGala.org. You can register for free. It's only an hour, Monday at 6.30. Come and check it out. We have a great program. Learn more about who we are and what we do. Okay, so thank, thank you, you for that shameless plug. That's no, plugs are good. Thank you to Matt Kudis from NAMI. Thank you to Fiona Lowenstein from Body Politic. Thank you from, for, to Tess Summer from the um, Center for Social Responsibility at the Marlene Meyerson JCC. Um, thank all of you. We will keep you posted about future sessions of Justice in Action. As I said before, we don't seem to run out of topics. We're going to be talking shortly. I'm not sure if it's next month or the month after about the impact of COVID um, worldwide. Uh, while we struggle with it in New York. And I'm also imagining, as things change in Washington, that there will be new advocacy options, not just around the mental health issues we discussed tonight, but around COVID-related issues in general. And you will hear about that from us at the Center for Social Responsibility. Thanks all, and thanks again, Tess. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.